Hi, my name's Kipper. I'm a 56-year-old record producer, musician, songwriter, uh, and this is Lower Barn Studios in Hazelmere. And uh, yeah, I've done this for my whole life and uh, pleased to be here talking to you. So yeah, I started playing the guitar when I was seven years old, thanks to my uh, wonderful dad who sadly died last year. He bought me my first guitar, which is here, a little famous guitar when I was seven. And um, I learned to play Sunshine of Your Love by Jimi Hendrix um, on one string. And, uh, and I kind of, when I look back on it, it was kind of some sort of positive affirmation always that I can make a living from making music because my dad had told me. So when as I got older and I was at school and the careers officers will say, well, you know, you're going to, you're going you know, to have a second string to your bow. I'd say, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to make a living from making music. That's what I'm going to do. And I, I said it repeatedly year in, year out. And it came true it, it, because I think, because my dad sort of made me, allowed me to manifest that as a possibility. Um, so I'm forever grateful to him for that. People know a lot of uh, stuff that I've done with Sting and I, I started working with him in 1999 and I met him because I'd been doing a, a two year stint with a Hollywood film composer called Trevor Jones and we were working on a Sharon Stone film called Freak the Mighty and uh, I'd, I'd written quite a few little lines and some sections for Trevor and it, you sort of do that's part of the, the deal when you're working with a kind of composer like him and we'd sent the stuff off to Sting who knew the director and the director had said, would he do the end title song? And Sting um, wrote this piece of music, which was, sounded really cool, he sent us a little demo. And then he said, well, why don't you guys come down and watch me record? And he was gonna he was come down to Salisbury, I'm gonna record with Manu Katche was playing drums, a, a, a good mate of mine now, a guy, a guy called Dave Hartley was playing Hammond and Dominic playing guitar. And we just turned up as voyeurs to this recording session. And Sting was just doing it at his Jacobean mansion down in Salisbury. And we were watching and it was fantastic. It was such a you know, great treat to do it. And I just thought this is a one off. I've got this, you know, I'm in this new career now doing film music. And we'd spent the whole day there. And at the end of it, he was doing the vocals and the whole song had to be done in a day. And I was, again, I was just sitting in the studio and the director, a guy called Peter Chelson was being, um, he was being a bit filmy and was going, Sting, just think the boy dies of cancer at the end and why don't you sing the middle later with a bit more emotion? And, and Sting's just trying to find a harmony. You know, he's just trying to find a harmony. And I just said, and I, and I didn't do it with any ego or with it. I just thought, he just needs a bit of a hand. He's been singing all day playing. I just said, why don't you just do a third for that first bit, then unison there, and that might take you into the key change. I don't remember what it was. And so he did it, did what I suggested. He went, oh, nice idea, Kipper. Yeah, like, thanks for that. And that was all that, that was the, it was literally like, you know, a five minute moment. And I remember going, fucking hell, Sting loves my idea. This is great. And uh, thought nothing more. About a month later, uh, I got a phone call. I had no work. I was decorating my flat. My wife was working, um, paying for the rent on the flat. And the phone went and I thought, oh, I'm not going to answer the phone. I just carried on decorating. And then there was the answer. And it was like, I always do a Geordie accent. Hey, all right, Nick, but it's like Sting here. Uh, do you fancy working with, uh, coming to work with me? I'm like running through the flat. Uh, hey, hello. He went, yeah, he goes, what are you up to? And I said, oh, I've got quite a bit on. I'm doing stuff, you know, but not saying I'm decorating. And he goes, well, like, he goes, I've got a record to do. And do you fancy coming out to Italy to just help me start it? I don't know what to do. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll come. And, um, and really interesting is that I, it was just for two weeks. He just booked me for two weeks. And uh, my mum said, I think you'll be out there for a lot longer. And I said, don't be stupid, mum. You know, you can have anybody in the world. You know, I'll just go and do, have to do a bit of programming. And, and yeah, and I went there for two weeks and stayed there for a year doing that, which became Brand New Day and co-wrote a song with him on it. And the whole thing, it was just a real, I had, I think because I went out there with no um, expectation and no attachment, I just, I just was genuinely thinking this is a great experience. Uh, I think that was what was unique because I saw lots of musicians come into our world then that became my world with him that were just sort of would freeze and wouldn't play particularly well or would be thinking this is the next big thing for them or you could see that they weren't in the, you know, it was, it was quite difficult when you're with someone that's has got that kind of reputation and you're so aware of what they're about. So I think that's what the magic was is that I was just kind of genuinely enthusiastic and excited to be doing it. 
And so we finished that record and then he asked me to MD the band and go on tour. So we went on a massive two year world tour. And then, uh, and it was just a, yeah, great. And then we did another record, Sacred Love, did some live, did some live records, lots of mixing. And it was real, it was exactly the right time of my life for me. I didn't have kids at the time, so I could give everything to it. So it was about six or seven years of, of good times. And I still see him regularly, we speak. Um, we were talking about Jacob Collier play uh, using these speakers, which I love, which we'll talk about. But um, I recently sent Sting Jacob's version of Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. And Sting, who's never a man to kind of be overly kind of, oh, my God, this is amazing, wrote back saying, I effing love it. I first heard of key speakers from Jacob Collier. So he'd mentioned them to me and I hadn't thought too much about them. I thought, well, if he's using them, they're probably great. But that was the end of me thinking about that. And then a good friend of mine that I was working with called Conrad Fletcher, who runs this mobile studio called uh, Mixbus. They do all the kind of national theatre live streaming recording. Said that he, he goes, do you want to borrow these speakers? I've just bought them. He goes, they're amazing. And I listened to them at his house. I listened to a Coldplay, tra Coldplay track and I'm not a big Coldplay fan. And I was listening to this Coldplay mix going, that is amazing. I love Coldplay. All of a sudden I loved Coldplay. So he lent them to me. I brought them here. And after an hour, I phoned him up and said, how can you have lent me these speakers knowing that I won't be able to listen to my ATC speakers anymore? Because they are phenomenal. I mean, it was the detail of them and the precision and the, uh, the, 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 um, the stereo imaging. I was just listening to, I was just listening to lots. Immediately, I started listening to some of my old mixes, stuff that I was working on. And I could hear all the great things and all the bad things in the, in the mixes on these speakers. And I also then went to play something and, the, and I didn't know about the uh, minimum latency setting. So I went, oh God, I can't use them because they don't, they, they, there's a delay because of all the processing. And I phoned up Conrad again and he said, no, you just got this minimum latency, press that and it will work. And I did that. So it's like, I can have them. I now just need to find out if someone will buy one of my kids so that I can buy the speakers. When I took stuff out of the studio, I'd listen to them. I'd go, oh, no, God, yeah, I'm a bit bass light on that. And God, it doesn't quite sound as exciting as it did when I listened to them here. They can't... Whereas with these speakers, you work hard to get things sounding great because they're so precise, but they're very uh, exciting. And then I take them home and it actually sounds better at home. Genuinely sounds better at home. I, I reference at home on a little Bose sound dock. Um, I think it's called a mini sound dock, isn't it, I think. And... Um, so in a very non-precise way, I just put it on, it's on top of the fridge and I just wander about listening to it. And, and everything that I've been doing here, when I take it back there and play it, it just sounds absolutely as vibey as it did here and often more so. So I go, God, the, the bass end is actually really good at home. So that's the, that's, that is my genuine experience of these speakers. The fact that I could hear all that means that then when I play it to someone else, I know that I will have picked up on anything that anyone else is going to have picked up on whether it's the A&R man or the manager. And it's just like, well, if you're hearing something that I'm not hearing, you've got to be either making it up or you've got better ears than I have. And so I think that's the confidence is that I sort of go, this is, this is how the, these tracks sound. Can we take your keys away? Take my keys away? No, you couldn't take them away. I, uh, I, at the moment, I'm, I've got a trip planned to go to Bali and, I've got, and they're, they're going to come with me. They're going to be shipped out there. I was going to take my little mini Neumanns out there, but they, these are going to come. I, I, everything's going to be listened to on these for hopefully forever.